Um, morning, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here, actually. And, and in fact, this is my, my first um, <coughs> Creative Mornings, which is ridiculous, um, to be honest with you, because um, when Nicole phoned me up and I sort of started to look into it, I was like, what? what? I've been missing out on all these amazing people. And um, so I'm very, very pleased to be here. And um, I found it quite, quite interesting trying to unpack <coughs> what I'm supposed to do today. So I hope I'm, I'm going to... Um, deliver what you're looking for. Um, but I thought what we perhaps might start with is a little bit of a sort of look into to Tricky Jigsaw and sort of kind of get that out of the way a little bit, but then sort of pepper that throughout the rest of the talk. But I suppose, as Nicole said, we started um, Tricky Jigsaw about three years ago. And, um, and it, was, it was off the back of Clever Boy, um, which is this shark detecting um, boy, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit in a minute. But what was really interesting was the fact of, I suppose, building a startup inside quite an established business. And in fact, um, I was just having a chat about this and, and the fact that what you've got is you've got a very dominant culture um, in, in, a, in a big big firm like M&C. Um, and then you're also trying to give birth to a culture at the same time. And that's really challenging. And um, But I would say three years on now, we've managed to get the best of both worlds. Um, and it's really amazing having um, a lot of group companies around you which give you access to lots of different skill sets. Um, there's some people from RE here. Um, we've got um, sports and entertainment. We've got 1440, which is a retail company. Um, and then we've got hidden characters, which is PR. And what's really interesting, actually, when you're working in the space of innovation or, or product development is you need all of those um, assets all of the time. Um, but it's crazy to build up that skill set um, and, and just have that solely on your books. So funny thing is Tricky Jiggles was quite small. Um, in the scheme of things, we're about eight people most of the time, but we scale up to about 15 um, on different projects. And ironically, most of the time, we're, um, we're rarely in the building. And I almost worry when we're all in the building because I'm kind of like, we're obviously not busy. Um, but, the, um, but the fact of the matter is we deploy into different companies. Um, in fact, straight after this, I'm going straight to the, the fish market, um, where we're their innovation partner on the, the new redevelopment there, um, which is a really, really different type of work, to be honest with you, but it's, um, it's really fascinating where we're going with that. But look, I'm going to stop ranting about that and just give you a bit of a, bit of a hype reel um, on us and give you a flavour of some of our work. Wakey, wakey. Um, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> that's um, it's a little bit of a flavour of what we get up to. I, I suppose the thing that's interesting is the business has changed a lot. Um, when we started, we were always sort of misconstrued as this sort of maker team. And there's nothing wrong with being a maker team, by the way, because it's critical to make something rather than nothing. And then, on the, then in sort of the second year, we were, we were a CX team and we we're constantly seen as sort of customer experience and UX. And, it's very much a, a core um, of us. But what we've actually discovered along the way is that what we're actually really becoming very good at is the facilitation of all of this. And the fact that actually what I'm endeavouring to do is employ very T-shaped people. Um, and what I mean by that is that they have a very strong foundation, but they're very open um, to, to different things. And 
by the way, they're quite hard to manage T-shaped people. Um, so, so when it, I was just talking about this to Karina actually, and I was just saying, you know, when it comes to annual reviews, normally you work on a job description and you look at sort of KPIs and stuff like that. It's not so great doing that when you want someone to sort of go off on a tangent and come back and actually expand their mind. So what we're doing now is we're shifting from job descriptions to job missions. And um, we're looking at having sort of canvases for individuals so we can kind of see where they've actually sort of expanded beyond that. At the same time, we do want them to be practitioners and be strong in one, one central thing. So as you can see, it's a bit of a dilemma, but actually facilitation um, and the skill sets around that are really key to kind of celebrating different things at different times. And I think over the years um, through, through my career, I sort of found that uh, agencies were always sort of quite quick to sort of take things on we hadn't done before. And we do that. But we also really recognise when we don't know how to do something and we bring someone in to help with that. So with, um, with Cleverboy, for example, you know, there was a, I would argue, almost a naive idea at the time. It was um, an amazing creative team that sort of cracked it to start with, which was uh, who are now in New York, actually. And they just had this um, idea of using a sonar head with machine learning. And you know what was so ridiculous was the fact that when we spoke to all the universities, Everyone was focused on nets, um, and I can kind of see why, right? Because nets were sort of perceived as working, but they had electro nets and bubble nets and all that kind of stuff. And us sort of thinking over here, for some reason, no one else was. I, I mean, I find that quite ridiculous, to be honest with you. But we spoke around all the universities, but we we're sort of like, in a way, not knowing about marine biology and how it worked was the very reason we could go over there. And then we found these amazing guys in Perth called Sharp Mitigation Systems, and. You see, at the time, we were sort of a subset of MMC. So you'd sort of phone up and go, oh, we're from MMC. And like, I don't know, we don't want any advertising. And you're like, no, 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 we want to talk to you about. And um, anyway, as you started to explore, they were like, hang on a minute. Yeah, that, that, could, that could work. So we were very lucky to actually have a very um, confident and brave CMO at Optus at the time who sort of ring-fenced us as a team. And we um, set about um, exploring if this was possible. And we got an old sonar head from a, <coughs> an oil rig that's traditionally used for um, shutting the, the vacuum fans on an on a oil rig where a, a seal might swim in, for example, so it stops it going in and all this kind of stuff. So we got one of those, which is a lot of money, actually, by the way. And then we basically created um, a software package that started to actually train it. And the thing with Cleverboy, it's, it gets better when it's in the water. And um, it's a bit like facial recognition. Do you remember when you would... Um, it would just go, oh, it's a face. It's just a face. And then it's like, oh, it's your face. And it's your face as a baby. And it's like, oh, this is remarkable. Well, this is how this works. It needs to be trained and it needs to live in the water. So um, we set about doing a lot of rigorous testing and moving through all of that. And um, I suppose what it's interesting about is the process that you have to go through where you're, you're actually sort of opening up and closing down and opening up and closing down. But in truth, we were very lucky to stumble into an area that someone hadn't thought about. Um, had the, the rigour and the discipline to go through it and the partners that were brave enough, smart enough and crazy enough to come on the journey with us. And we happened to hit completely new ground, which um, in some ways seems calculated, but it wasn't. It was a mixture of sort of bumping into things and then, then moving forward. Um, but that sort of set a foundation, I suppose, for um, moving forward. You know, suddenly we had people rocking up going, I want a clever boy. And you're like, OK. Um, that's a little bit easier said than done. But actually, when you start taking apart the work that you work on, you start to realise that there's actually methods and theories that go along that path. And I suppose that's what I wanted to talk about today, was the fact that the theme genius, I, it kind of conjures up images in your head almost immediately of, um, of this guy. And, um, and the fact that it's all about sort of eureka moments and... Um, and this individual um, sitting somewhere who suddenly sort of joined the dots and, and thought about something in a really different way. But you know what? I think um, what's happening is the fact that we've actually moved on significantly from there. I think the thing is that what's really interesting is the fact that actually it's our collective brains that are actually where perhaps genius needs to lie going forward. Um, and I suppose the thing is that now you sort of if you think about genius and, and the attributes of it, you jump into sort of people like Bjork, um, who are sort of practitioners in a very different way. 
um, who've really got to know their art, who've really sort of pushed it and kind of created a, a sound and a label and a um, and, and, and diverse sort of mix from their skill set, the fact they've got really good at one thing, which has allowed them to sort of expand into other areas. And I think that's really interesting because if you Google genius, um, their definition that you get in a search result says this. Um, when you sort of go off on Wikipedia and stuff like that, you get into this sort of individual zone and stuff. But what I really liked was the, was the creative power part. And I hadn't really sort of thought about genius in that context to start with. I always sort of thought about it as scientists and these people great breaking ground there. But actually, the fact of the matter is that actually this, this creative power, which I, I'm taking a bit of a leap of faith here, but I believe a lot of you are working in the creative industries and, um, and uh, day in, day out, doing your best to get the best work up. And I think the thing that's really interesting with when they, people look to dissect geniuses, they start to sort of see some of the commonalities that I think we can apply in our day to day. And, and that's what I'm sort of keen to go through. So I keep picking this up and I'm drink here. I'm gonna... Here we go. Okay. So if you think about creative power, you think of someone like David Bowie. And um, I was very, very lucky to go down to that exhibition in, um, in Melbourne. Did anyone else go to that? How, how amazing was that? Um, and what was really interesting, I went down, um, it was quite an extravagant Father's Day present, actually. I was quite surprised. I sort of normally get like some socks or something, but, <laughs> but my, um, my amazing wife had, had basically organized for us all to go to, um, to Melbourne. And um, we took at, our ta at the time, um, what was he? I think he was my son Archie, who's five, and my daughter, who would have been three. And we were actually quite worried about the fact that we wouldn't see any of this exhibition because they'd just get bored and um, they would just run amok and all that kind of stuff. But how wrong were we? They came in, they put their headphones on, they were dancing all the time, they loved the costumes, they loved the fact of all the changes that went through his life. But I also, so, so actually a little bit of a backstory. So my wife had decided that I really loved David Bowie. And, and um, the truth was, I, I, can't, I don't know where she got this from because I didn't necessarily love David Bowie at that point. And, um, and I was like, oh, it's a really nice present. Shit, how much is this costing for us to go to Melbourne? And, um, and, the, and the fact of the matter is my son um, is quite allergic to most of planet Earth. So when it, when, <clears throat> whenever we go anywhere, we have to have a flat and we have to cook all our own food and all this kind of stuff. So we don't really go many places all the time, which is, well, that's not true. It's changing now. He's a little bit more resilient. But anyway, I went to this exhibition and it was amazing. And it reminded me of all the music I, that was his, that I'd sort of forgotten was him. It reminded me of all the chapters of his life and the fact that he constantly reinvented himself, both, I suppose, responding to culture, but also defining culture. And you know what I found so amazing was, was dissecting into his practice. Um, I don't know if you remember from the exhibition, but the, um, he wrote a piece of software that would scramble his, his lyrics. So it would push him to think about different ways to express himself. I just thought this was remarkable. I didn't know this. I just thought it was this crazy, kooky guy that was just talented in music. But no, he, he had to work at that art and he pushed himself all the time. And I think the thing is, this is what I've realised is the fact that, you know, it's debatable whether he's a genius or not. I think he is. And you know what was really interesting? My son thought he was too, because when he started school that year, they, they went around and they asked everyone, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he didn't say he wanted to be David Bowie. He said he wanted to be the next David Bowie. He then also said that he would have a band by the time that he's seven. Um, <clears throat> and he's currently learning clarinet, piano, and he's getting into that. Um, and um, whereas everyone else was talking about firemen and nurses, and I was kind of like, wow, look at what we've done here. Um, we've, um, we've taken this amazing little brain into something that we didn't think was necessarily right for him. And it's turned out being so inspirational to kind of, I suppose, these early chapters. He now currently wants to be an archaeologist. So anyway, we're on a journey. <laughs> but but my, point, <clears throat> my point here is that we need to get out and have some experiences. Because I think what's really interesting is the fact that Bowie was just so brilliant at capturing a time. Um, but also the fact of defining the next time and the next time and pushing through. And I think it's really sad that he's not with us anymore. But you know what? what's so sad is that we actually also 
really look deep at these people when they're gone, when we should take the time to look deep at them when they're here. Um, and I think um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So look, there's eight behaviours of geniuses. And um, what I think is really interesting is the fact that actually when you explore them, there are a lot of the methods that um, uh, I would say innovation practices are doing on a daily basis. They certainly are what Tricky's doing, or at least trying to do. Um, you see, geniuses work in divergent and convergent thinking. You know the, the double, double diamond? Who works? Who's, who's got design thinking background and stuff? Here we go. Yeah, so really familiar with that, right? The fact that, in, in fact, straight after this, I'm going to go and do a workshop in, um, at the fish market. And um, the, fir the first part of the day is going to be <clears throat> going wide, nothing's wrong. Um, second part of the day is going to be about narrowing that down and applying the filters and the strategies that we've been working through. And I think the thing is, it's the fact that actually the core um, behaviours of businesses sometimes trap where things can go. And I think it's really sad in a way is the fact that actually, you know, we work with a lot of businesses now who are, oh, but we're a bank. Oh, but we're an insurance company. Oh, but we're this. And it's kind of like, well, that doesn't apply anymore. The thing is, we have to sort of kind of get up to that purpose and we have to really sort of expand where things can go. So in that, excuse me, in that way, we have to create this freedom to rethink, this space where we're safe, but also we're brave. The fact that we set some rules and we can play with those rules. Um, what's really interesting is someone like Thomas Edison, which does jump to mind when you, when you think about um, geniuses, of course, but he has about a thousand patents to his name. And of course we know he's famous for the, the light bulb and the camera and, um, and, and also the phonograph. But what's really interesting is he was also really famous for, for going wide. Um, and then he was also really famous for going really tight as well. And the fact that actually he was a pioneer of um, collaborative teamwork to take these things to market because there's no point coming up with a light bulb if no one can get one. So you've got to think about the manufacturing processes and all the go to market that lives around that. So that divergent and convergent is critical. And it's critical to, I think what you should try and do is and apply into day to day. We've been very lucky, I suppose, is that we've managed to change. You see, see my background is I worked at the Monkeys and at Heist and I was always sort of like a head of digital. And what that tend to mean was in the early days was you were the production guy that did digital. And then I was the strategy guy that did digital. And I suppose you had to learn all of those areas to get it done because it was such an emerging thing at the time. But what was really interesting is the fact that I, I learned quite quickly that agencies were kind of, <clears throat> you cracked an idea here, you passed it here and these people made it. But what was really missing was the fact that actually digital, as you well know, is a whole different set of rules. So this idea that comes up here doesn't necessarily apply down here. So you need to go back to the problem that idea was trying to solve and see if that idea can work in those mediums. So I suppose in the early days, I was very much on the receiving end of things coming down. But then in the latter years, I was very much pushing back. And the fact that we were up there at the very, very front, and that sort of served, I suppose, me well and us well as we went into Tricky, because now we don't necessarily have strict deadlines that are guided by media, um, which is often the thing that was compounding things before. The fact that you were being innovative in a really confined space a lot of the time where you were scrambling to support an ad campaign or something that was sitting around it and doing something different in that space at the time. Whereas now what it is, we set our own rules. And part of that is the fact of how we start. And we start by um, really creating a very open engagement session where we um, really take a couple of weeks to get to know that business, but also to get to know the opportunities. We go and meet all the stakeholders and we talk to them all and, um, and start to understand their pain points. And in doing that, we can start to shortcut to where things need to go. So we create this sort of safe place where we can push things further. And in doing that, you start to understand where the appetite actually lives. Because I touched on earlier with, <clears throat> with Optus and Cleverboy was the fact that we had a rogue CMO, really, at the time, who ring-fenced us. And it sounded like a dream come true. The fact that actually what you had is someone who was backing your idea, who gave you the space to go forward. But what was actually challenging was the fact that when you came out the other end, you weren't necessarily embraced by everyone. On the flip side, something like Fire Blanket, we are, um, we are managing stakeholders all the way through. On the flip side, that takes twice the amount of time. <laughs> so, so I don't know what the right way or the wrong way is, but I do know that one thing that's working well for us is opening minds at the very beginning and setting that ambition 
and starting to build that trust. Because if you work closer with people, you kind of push where they can go. Um, filling life with experiences. I talked about this with um, with um, with my son, but but also with, with myself. It's um, I'm very lucky to have worked in lots of different places, and I think it's quite funny when you go for interviews when someone goes, "Oh, you move around a lot," and you're kind of like, "What?" And actually, I, I, I've I've almost employing more people that move around a lot now. Um, I obviously want people to stay, um, but at the same time, what I've realised is the fact that if you work for someone that doesn't let you grow, you need to grow yourself. And you can do that by sort of getting around and having those experiences in other places. I'm employing this really um, fantastic guy at the moment who um, came to me and said, I'll give you two years. And, uh, <laughs> And I was like, oh, okay, right. And he goes, um, <clears throat> I'm going to be an inventor. And um, I see Trigger Jigsaw as part of that path. Um, I've, I've ticked off a few of the other boxes. Um, and um, basically, I'll give you two years. So, great, great. I'm really, really pleased with coming on board. And, um, and, um, but, but I must say, it's, it's fantastic. We're really clear on what each other wants from each other. And I think... What's interesting is our relationship's changing as, as that relationship goes on, and we're probably only about six months in now. But, um, so we'll see what happens in two years. I'll report back. But, um, but I think the thing that's really interesting is the fact that I'm meeting these people that are coming in, and I think it's their passion that interests me. Um, and sure, I want skill sets. Sure, I want this diverse thinking stuff. But we can actually educate on that, because you, what you can't educate on necessarily is, is passion and enthusiasm, because that's sort of kind of part of the person. Um, do you know Maria? Um, I really, um, I find this lady really fascinating. Um, what, did anyone go to the installation that was at uh, Walsh Bay when she was out here with a fantastic... Did, did you participate? Yeah, the scary one. <laughs> great, great. But there's also another one. That, um, so I <clears throat> got to know John Caldor a little bit. And um, we would... So John Caldor has Caldor Pro Art Projects, who did incredible, I would say, gifts to... Sydney, if not Australia, um, and really helping us sort of think differently. And he's an incredible brain, um, and I would um, go out of your way to go to any of his um, um, installations, exhibitions, go forward. But he was talking to me, um, in fact, last week about um, when he went down to um, the installation, which he'd obviously organised, but Maria had basically taken his hand and um, had started to do this walk up the, the wharf. And now, I don't know if you know about this, but that walk takes two hours as part of her installation. So he was about 10 minutes in, he'd put his phone down, he didn't have his watch, it was part of the rules. And um, he said he was basically going out of his goddamn mind. Um, the fact that actually this is really, really painful. But actually what happened was after the 10 minutes, it started to be something that he gave into. Um, it started to be something that he opened up to. And all of a sudden joy came and all of a sudden observation came and all this kind of stuff. And I think one thing that I see from that is the fact that we have to fill our life with experiences, but we also have to take the time to enjoy them because whilst we can go to these galleries and whilst we can go to all these things, if we're not actually present, we're kind of failing the fact of being there. And these bloody devices, love them, hate them, it's creating new worlds for us. I don't know about you, but I have ghost vibrations in my pocket. And... Um, and um, <laughs> And, and, and I don't know whether I'm seeking attention or, or, or I'm sort of my body's actually just got hardwired to do it. So try and keep these things away from you so you can let those experiences in. Um, not normal is definitely an attribute of, of, um, of I would say, um, the team makeup that you need um, for innovation, but also it's kind of a key attribute of being a genius as well. When you look at all of the different people that sort of come to mind, they've all got something special about them. And... Um, you know, I think it was uh, Nikola Tesla. He, for example, had OCD, couldn't touch spherical objects by all accounts, and was um, very focused on cleanliness. Um, on the flip side, you've got Da Vinci, who never washed at all, um, and um, would sleep in his robes and was constantly sort of pushing where he was going all the time. Um, all of my guys and girls have great hygiene, um, <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but at the same time, they're all radically different. Um, I've got a 10-year veteran of stand-up comedian um, who's 
who basically now applying himself to sort of facilitating workshops and pushing them forward. Um, we've got basically um, a, a, sci a French scientist, for want of a better description, who's um, quite hard to understand, but at the same time is the smartest guy in the room, I guarantee it. Um, we've got a chef who happens to be a very incredible design thinker. We've got product managers. Um, we've got ex-architects. And we've got all these people that are really passionate about breaking the status quo and doing something different. And it's really fun working with those people because you can imagine if you had a world full of Elon Musk's, you wouldn't really move forward. You need this mix and you need to really focus on understanding people's um, sort of abnormalities, but also how you can celebrate them together and bring them together. Mastery and expertise. It's kind of, kind of interesting this. You, you guys are probably familiar with the Malcolm Cladwell quote, but actually that's been debunked of late. Um, but I suppose the thing is, you know, we do have to focus on our practice. We do have to rehearse. We do have to give ourselves the time to sort of get good at things. Um, and what <clears throat> I suppose I've realised with that is the fact that you've got to put the time in to get the time out. Um, and, and box that out. And I can't say I've actually cracked this, by the way, but I try to design my weeks, and we try to design our weeks to do that. Um, the fact of giving ourselves time to prepare and practice and push things forward, because that's ultimately where you can get better um, and, and, and push things that much further. Um, a lot of what we do, and, and I suppose also this, you know, obviously taking the attribute from genius, is there's a bit of guesswork and there's a bit of imagination. Um, but the thing is, you're safe. Because when you come back to um, the, um, <clears throat> the convergent thinking, that's where you can start to sort of validate. So you can go wild, you can push things out, um, and you can bring them back. This guy, Ray Kurzweil, is, is a futurist, he's an inventor, he's an entrepreneur, he's all of these things. But he leaps forward with where things can go, and I think we all can. You know, the, is it William Gibson who, um, who says, you know, um, the future's here, it's just not evenly distributed. And it bloody well is. It's, you know, you, you look around, you start hunting, you'll basically see that everything's right there, it's just whether the timing's going to be right and the dots are formed. So you really do have the ability to push yourself that much further. You just need the time to, to sort of put in, to do some guesswork, but then start to validate backwards. Um, everyone says this, right? It's kind of like, it's almost just like, yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. You've got to fail to sort of move forward and stuff. Um, it's really interesting. I mean, this is um, the Falcon 9 not landing. Um, <clears throat> this is um, SpaceX's um, space mission. This is their drone barge, um, which is called, um, of course, I still love you, which is obviously what you'd call a barge. Um, <laughs> but, the, um, but I think the thing that's really interesting is Elon publicly fails quite a lot. Um, some of the early Tesla cars would burst into flames. Um, you know, they publicly fail. I mean, it's quite hard to not publicly fail on a space rocket landing, to be honest with you. You can't really do that in private. But, um, but at the same time, it's the fact that you do have to break things and, have, and be comfortable with it. And what I would say is the fact that there's no point in failing if you don't reflect. So, so it's really important to take the time to reflect. You know you have retrospectives with the team and all that kind of stuff, but try and hardwire it into your practice take the time out. So we do, we do a reflection on a, um, a Monday morning and a Friday morning, um, which is sort of setting up the week. So we look at what happened on the weekend and we look at what's happening in the week. And then we do it again on a Friday. So that's, that's a team reflection. And then we do a surgery every fortnight. And um, at the moment, they're getting a bit pushed aside with some projects. But um, I really notice quite quickly when we don't do it, um, we kind of quite quickly lose sight of each other. Um, and it's really important to know what people are doing both at home and at work to understand how they're kind of behaving in the space and you can support them in the, the right way. But ultimately, it's a filter for failing too, is the fact that actually it's okay to stumble and fall because you're never going to break new ground if you don't. Um, so it's, it's good to sort of push things forward in that way. Um, action and persistence. I, I'm sort of, I don't know, there's this great book that I would recommend everyone has a go at. It's sort of, it suits me just fine. It's called Strengths Finder. And you read half the book, and then you do an online survey, and then you read the rest of the books. It's quite short, which I like. Um, but it tells you what you're strength, strong at. Now, some of it you'll just go, yeah, 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 I know that. But some of it you'll be quite surprised at. 
I did this for the whole team, and um, it was really, really powerful in understanding different attributes because I'm, I found out that sort of I'm quite, I'm quite good at ideating and I'm quite good at catalyzing, but I'm not very good at seeing things all the way through. Um, so I need to sort of have people around me that can help push that, and I'm very, very lucky to have that in my business partner who is, is basically just absolutely brilliant at pushing things through all the way to completion. He does take no prisoners on the way. It's sometimes the challenge, so you have to go and sort of clear up some of the mess that's left behind. Um, but at the same time, everyone knows that we're trying to push things forward. Um, I think um, old matey here um, was very, very good at this, and you know, by all accounts was tyrannical in doing that. Um, but actually, when you talk to him uh, in his biography, I didn't ever talk to him, by the way. Um, the, um, when you look at his biography, though, they say, what are you most proud of? And you sort of think, oh, he's going to say the iPod or he's going to say the iPhone. But he actually says the team. And the fact that actually creating a team that can constantly output things that sort of break outside the status quo, that his very DNA was thinking different. Um, and, um, and the fact that he took that all the way through the business and that legacy is living on pretty well. Um, you can see that that culture runs very, very uh, fast through the company. Um, finally, um, sort of me time, and there's a really interesting thing that's from, from Steve Jobs as well. I don't know if you've, um, there's a great Wired article on the new building. I don't know if anyone's taken the time to read that. Um, but basically the, the ring, um, I think it's called the ring, has, a, has an, almost like a national park in the middle of it. And um, the reason they put the park in there was to, um, really the fact that actually when everyone was getting stuck, they all, always sort of go to nature to try and break out of um, the sort of problem and stuff. So they're planting like 9,000 trees in the center of that, that space. And I think it's really interesting is the fact that actually we've been doing a lot of work on ourselves and we happen to be stationed across the road from um, the botanical gardens. So I've started to do walking meetings now and started to take the time to sort of go over there and sit down because I've realized that if I spend 10 minutes over there, it's, as, it's almost more efficient than spending an hour in the office um, because I just get time to think, I get time to open up. And that me time is really critical. This was Headspace talking to me yesterday. And um, you know you get these little quotes? Um, I thought it was quite, quite well timed. Um, um, but ultimately the thing is, it's the only people that control, can control our time is us. Um, and that's, that's really, really critical that we take the time to do that. Um, because what I'm finding is that I've, I had a group of people that brought in a lot of this reflection and meditation stuff into the team and I was quite I don't know, it's a little bit, this is a bit hippy-dippy, do I really, really need to do this? And, um, but actually the fact that we are all just massive fans of it now, um, and we, it, it's all about the practice and, and pushing it forward, and I would really recommend that you um, try and build it into your daily routine if you can. So, um, so let's just take a pause for a minute. I, I suppose really, in conclusion, whilst these attributes are, are, are those of a genius, they're also the attributes of, I would say, each and every one of us. The fact that one of us will be put good at some of this stuff. So, so I think the thing is, it's, you know, genius isn't them. It's, um, it's us as a group. And, and the fact that actually, if you think about the attributes and you understand what's around you, you can build genius teams. And I think that's kind of the exciting thing here, is the fact that actually, if you start to know your colleagues and take the time to do that, do the strengths finder, for example, use these different tools, you can work out how to create a genius brain amongst you. Because whilst these people are exceptional and whilst these people are remarkable, they weren't doing it totally on their own. They were just the ones that we sort of know about the most. And the thing is, I think if we all put ourselves together and start to understand the powers that we've got around us, we can, we can be genius every day. And I think that's a, that's a great opportunity for all of us. So, so thank, you for, um, thank you for listening. Oh, yes. Um, well, I touched on the kayaking a bit. So, um, so I know this amazing guy who you should actually get to talk here if you haven't had already, Andrew Simpson. Um, so Andrew Simpson's an industrial designer. He's got a firm called Vert Design. And um, we used to be neighbours when I was at the Monkeys, um, and we both like motorcycles as well. So anyway, we met over motorcycles. Turns out he's got this kit boat company, um, which makes rowboats. It's called the Balmain Boat Company. It's going really well. Anyway. I grew up with um, skin-on-frame kayaks. My dad had one. And a skin-on-frame kayak is basically, it's a bit like um, 
It's, oh, that's a frame with a skin on it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and, um, but anyway, what was really interesting, it seemed that Australia seemed to skip skin on frame kayaks. I don't know why, um, but they were originally from um, the Inuits and um, originally bone. Um, and seal skin, and they were basically the hunter's boat in a get out. And I, and I love what a kayak does for me and the people that I take with it because you, you get perspective from the city and you get in one with the water and all this kind of stuff. But anyway, cut a long story short, I wrote this proposal to Andrew going, Look, I think you're missing your boat from your range. And um, he was like, Oh, yeah, kayaks. Oh, I hadn't really thought about skin or frame. And anyway, he goes, I really like the idea of this. Why don't we start a business together? So we did, and it's called O600. And um, we basically built this boat. Um, there was actually, we got, we got away with it quite lightly. We, we did about two prototypes. The first one was terrible. The second one, we nailed it. And that's the one that you can basically um, buy now from the site. We're currently working on a new one. Um, but it's, I think it's, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the lightest kayak in the world, but it's only 10 kilograms, which is crazy. And um, what we found was the biggest problem that people have and why they don't kayak is, is putting it on the car and taking it down to the water. Um, what we've, but what we inadvertently did was, so our mission is to um, help people get to the water more easily, but we actually built a kit car, which means you need to build it. You need woodworking skills. So we haven't quite cracked that because you've now got to be a woodworker to do it. So the new one is a glueless um, frame car, which we're working on at the moment. But we went on to win the, the Good Design Award that year, um, which was really fun. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's great. So um, yeah, everyone should kayak, by the way. What, what was your question? Yeah, so the, so the question was, um, with, with Cleverboy, um, was it um, a eureka moment or was it a series of things that got, got, got us there? Look, it's, it's really funny. So, so I, um, I wasn't there when the idea was cracked. I came in to run it through. So I was, I was just wrapping up at the Monkeys at the time and then I, I came in as um, the head of innovation. And um, so basically came in and, and fr from what I understand is the creative team were quite interesting guys. They're called Jono and Paul, and they're, um, they're in New York now. Um, but they, um, one of them was English and one of them was Australian. The English guy was just terrified of all the things that Australia uh, can kill you. <laughs> and um, the other guy was just thought this was hilarious. And um, so, the, so the brief that came in was about um, basically how do you change the conversation from the size of the network to what the network does? And at the time, I don't know if anyone remembers, but Google were... So this is about 2014. Google were traveling the world doing the rebrief project. So they're encouraging agencies to respond to briefs in very different ways. So what you would normally would have done is like a brand campaign or something like that about that. And um, so anyway, the guys looked at this. The purpose of Optus at the time was to be Australia's wingman. Um, and suddenly we started to look at how, what was the best way to demonstrate that. And um, I think it was a series of sort of schoolboy naivety in the sense of, oh, doesn't Sonar identify fish? Um, and, oh, couldn't use facial recognition to do it. And I think putting those two together really just started the process. And, and this is what's interesting, right? Because at first it was kind of like, came on board and we're taking the Eureka to work out if it's possible. In other work that we do, we're systematically coming up with the idea. And what I've realized is there's no right way or wrong way. It's like, if anything, it's a mixture of chaos with systems. Um, and you've got to kind of let it in. Because when we first sort of, assembled we got very strict on CX processes and HCD and all this kind of stuff and then we realized that actually it was kind of trapping people that wanted to work in different ways um, so yes it was a sort of I would say it was a eureka in that particular example um, in other ways it's very systematic and we come to it through a, 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 matter, a, a matter of sort of trial and error but we're using the, the two together yeah yeah it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a tricky one Look, I, I actually, you know what? I have got an answer to that question. So, so the thing, how we, so we have a lab, of course we do. Um, and um, so basically it's, it's, you can come down and have a look at it, anyone can come down and have a look. It's a glass room and um, it's, it's, it has got the, the expected maker stuff, it's got the, the 3D printer and all that kind of stuff, but actually what it primarily gets used for is a place to get people's brains out in the open. So what we work on a lot of the time is actually, um, although some people go, oh, for Christ's sake, it's a two-hour meeting or it's a half-day half meeting, we run it like an entire workshop. So, so what's interesting is when we're working with um, different types of creative brains is that we do look for them to come into the brain and uh, come into the room and empty their brains out and get first thoughts out in the open, but then finding time for them to sort of 
be together in a brainstorm, but then have private time to focus on the ideas that they had come out. The thing that we find really challenging, and this is why I need to sort of look at probably my team a bit more, is that currently we pull on MNC's resources to pull people in. That doesn't mean that that person is exclusively mine. Sometimes we design sprints to try and lock them into a project for a longer time. So what might happen is they can come in and do a workshop with us, but then they get pulled on to something else. But where we find that the best thing is to actually have a week-long sprint, you have team catch-ups where it's like a half-day workshop where you're all going as far as you possibly can, but then you're giving them some sort of concentration time where they can think of something new coming back in again and going again. So it's all about the design of that time. Um, and I know that you know coming up with ideas doesn't necessarily work into these two hours, <laughs> um, but, but what we find is that what we're doing is we're just getting things out in the open and allowing possibilities to happen. So we're designing that experience. Um, in a perfect world, there'd be, um, I'd have them full time and I'd be able to control the time completely. And I think this is the challenge is the fact of when you're working for multiple clients is controlling that team. So we tend to have three people working on a team uh, on a client at any one time. So that's like a product um, director, um, a CX um, director, um, and then basically what we call a, um, a CX uh, strategist. And then they pull in people as and when needed. But a lot of it's about that investigation to start with. And then we sort of create the tools for ideation around that. So that helps. Yeah, so how do we manage to tee people? Um, oh look, I, I haven't quite cracked it yet. Um, and, I, and I don't know if I ever will. Um, but the, but the thing is, what we're looking at at the moment is creating missions rather than job descriptions. We're also looking at creating um, uh, people canvases. You get team canvases at the moment, which we use for the start of a project, but I'm looking to create individual ones. I suppose the thing is, it's, it's really, it's hard. Because you see, the thing is, and to the earlier question about the sort of process, you know, you have got to drive things forward. So the, um, there is a level of, we do need you to work through what you've come here to do, but there's also giving people freedom to do other stuff. So we're looking at sort of um, like freedom to rethink days where you can basically kind of step out of work, but um, you know, maybe go to a gallery or maybe go to a park or maybe go to things like that where you're concentrating, um, I suppose, on where you're taking things rather than the day-to-day -day of the I dotting and the T crossing. Um, but, it, but it is really challenging. You know, like you come up to a review and you go, um, and you're suddenly talking about many things they've done and, you, and you're, obviously people still have the expectations of, pay rises and title changes and all this kind of stuff. So giving the freedom um, to do things, but also giving them the trajectory so that they can grow. Um, so we're working on that. But what we are planning to do is once we've got some methods in place that we're gonna, we're gonna get that out in the public, um, we're not gonna keep it purely to ourselves. Um, because I think the thing is, if we can let people um, really expand, it's, um, it, it, the possibilities are endless, right? It's, it's when we trap people that things go wrong. You know, and, and, um, and I think that's the thing is, and it's, it's easy to stand up here and say this stuff, but, and doing it is, um, is a different thing, but you know, we have to kind of let people breathe and we have to let them kind of be comfortable. You know, like you know, the anxiety of sometimes tackling things new is a really big challenge for us. You know, we, a lot of emotions, you know, when new people come on board, um, I think they sometimes feel out of their depth because we're doing things they haven't done before. And normally they're, they're, they're applying things that they're, uh, processes that they've done before. Um, but we're kind of like, no, 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 no. Like every project we do is different. Um, that's quite challenging. It's not like, oh, we're doing banner ads for someone else or we're doing a website for somewhere else. Like we're, we're working with different tech, we're working with different suppliers, we're working with different stuff. So what we found is it's actually our, how we design the engagement has become our method, not the building of the thing. Um, and then that allows you to sort of go forward a bit more. Oh, John Caldor. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 sorry, yeah. So, John Caldor is um, Caldor Art Projects. Um, so, he is um, he's the facilitator, I suppose, of bringing amazing artists here. So, he's brought Gilbert and George here, uh, Jeff Coons, things like that. But if you Google him, you'll find um, his site and his works are amazing. He's, he's got an incredible story. Um, your second question was about um, technology and people and how it's going to play out. Yeah. Look, it's really interesting. I suppose that. It, Innovation sort of gets misconstrued as being technology a lot of the time. And, and, um, and I think the thing is, you know, I used to find, especially when I was sort of like head of digital, it was, I used to walk into a room and you constantly have people wanting to outsmart you all the time. Like, oh, I know about this tech, or I know about this tech. And you're like, 
And I used to kind of um, sort of take that on with gusto um, because I was quite versed in that and I had an absolute insatiable appetite for technology and I still do. But what I've realized is the fact that actually it has to come back to a human problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and, and ultimately finding that problem is actually harder than you think. Um, because when you start asking why of things, it's when you drill down because you know, the amount of people that stand in the room and go, VR, what are we gonna do with VR? And you're kind of like, well, how is it applicable to the problem that we're trying to solve? And then all of a sudden it starts to come into focus or, or it doesn't. And I think the thing is, you can see things that when their time is not right, um, but then you can see things when their timing is. I mean, you take Google Glass, for example, you know, you know, standing back, I think it came into the world in the right way. In a way, it was kind of experimental. They brought people on board, but unfortunately, it's sort of very quickly seen as this spy camera and the fact that what was it doing? Ironically, we've now got all Alexa in our home and home in our home, and we're not seeming to freak out just as much about that, but that's now in our home talking all the time. But anyway, perhaps because it's not taking pictures, it's not so alien, but I don't know. So um, how things will play out, I think we have to find a happy space. I mean, AI is, is both exciting and terrifying. Um, I think the thing that I'm really excited about by it is it will give us superpowers. Um, I was reading about a, um, a designer that was designing a new crossbow and um, they were, I don't know why he's designing a crossbow, but anyway, the, um, but he was pushing the materials as far as they could go with the form factor. So what he would have done potentially before is build the bow, pulled the string back and it broke because the, the material couldn't do it, but you could bring those material instructions into the AI so he could use it like a paintbrush or a, or a tool to do that. And I thought, wow, that's, that's fascinating in the sense of what it will give us is this incredible knowledge quite quickly, the fact that we could build new kayaks, for example, that we could just push the, the material where it could go and quickly understand that it's not going to work. So it means that we can prototype a lot faster. Um, so I think it sort of remains a work in progress how it goes out. I mean, I think the thing that worries me a little bit is that a lot of the technology that we use in our daily lives started with military. <laughs> um, uh, GPS and um, the internet and all that kind of stuff. And notoriously, that's where they spend the most money to push the possibilities. It worries me a little bit that you could have autonomous vehicles that are designed to fight. Um, and I know that Elon Musk is out there at the moment, but on the flip side, I think having creative people like all of you pushing where these things can go to actually um, push humanity forward is exactly the antidote to, to those, those bad possibilities. So, there you go. Thank you.